Blinking and LED, the hello world of embedded systems. For those of us who have been doing this for a while, it's a basic exercise hardly worth mentioning, but something we embedded engineers care about, given the constraints of our hardware, is creating small programs, sometimes just for the sake of it. And with this in mind, I challenged myself to see how small I could make Blinky. For some contrast, I started at the opposite extreme and made it as bloated as I could. Then I stripped away layers of abstraction, one by one, until all that remained was a machine code program just a dozen bytes in size. And finally, I took a drastic step to bring it all the way down to zero bytes. The rules of Blinky are simple. Write a program that runs on a microcontroller and blinks an LED. And for less ambiguity, in my rules of Blinky, the LED must blink at a steady interval of 1000 milliseconds. My setup consists of a soulless breadboard hosting an evaluation board based on the STM32L4, powered and programmed through USB. An LED is connected to one of the GPIOs through a series resistor to limit the current. I deliberately picked a more powerful microcontroller than necessary to ensure it could fit every version of Blinky. So starting at a higher level of abstraction, with so much at our disposal these days, it can be hard to pick the right solution, even for the simplest of problems. But let's be real, it was obvious I would need some form of AI and cloud for this. It's 2025 after all. So I decided to set up a web server on my microcontroller to expose a simple REST API that would let me send an HTTP request from somewhere else, in this case a Google Cloud server, in order to toggle the LED every second. But there was one problem with this approach. This microcontroller, like many others, has no way of directly connecting to the internet. There are several ways around this, and one straightforward way is to attach an Ethernet module like the Wisnet W5500 and connect it to the microcontroller via SPI. And that's what I did. The microcontroller on one end and an ethernet cable on the other. To avoid spending too much time implementing stuff myself, I took a more out of the box software approach and went with Zephyr Artos, an increasingly popular real-time operating system that I've grown to like in my day job. Zephyr offers support for many boards, including the one I use in this video, and have drivers for all sorts of things, most importantly, it has a network stack and a driver for my Ethernet module. Setting up a project is fairly easy. A couple of commands to clone the dependencies. Note, I'm not getting into the details of Zephyr in this video. It comes with a bit of a learning curve, but there are plenty of good resources, and one of those are the available code samples, which often serve as a good starting point. I base most of my code on the dumb HTTP server sample by copying to my workspace, renaming things and then making a few modifications to implement the toggle LED REST API endpoint. Much is done through project configuration in Zephyr. For example, I enable DHCP in my project file to automatically assign an IP address. As said, the STM32 board I'm using is already supported by Zephyr. It means that there is a device tree file, just like in Linux, that describes the board. But since I've connected an Ethernet module and an LED, I still had to add a device tree overlay to describe that addition. Finally, I could run west build with my board target to build everything. After flashing, I can look at the UART log to confirm that the server is running and that an IP is assigned. And running curl to send an HTTP request, I can see that the LED turns on. After that, I set up a virtual machine in Google Cloud. And to make things more interesting, I set it up in South Africa. Then I SSH'd into the machine and wrote a simple Python script that sends a request to my microcontroller every second. And sure enough, running it, I could see the LED blink. But naturally, having it so far away introduces some latency. While this might not be noticeable to the naked eye, the timing requirement in my rules of Blinky enforces a strict 1000 millisecond blink interval and anything else is unacceptable. So to improve on that, it was time to throw in some AI into the mix as well. As it often is with complex solutions, they lead to problems in need of more complex solutions. First, I collected latency data over time and then I used machine learning to train a recurrent neural network that predicts the next latency based on a sequence of previous latencies. Then, on the Google Cloud machine in South Africa, I called the model after each request to predict how long to sleep before the next request to maintain a 1000 millisecond blink interval. 
Now, of course, this was naive and didn't make things better. If anything, it made things worse. It turns out predicting latency is quite hard. But I think the important thing is to use AI and not that it actually works. Still, it's something to know there is a server in South Africa that sends a request every second that has to travel all the way to my microcontroller in Sweden. But all this complexity also comes at a cost, not counting the millions of bytes required on the host side. This program takes up close to 100,000 bytes on the microcontroller, and as fun as it is to fool around, it was time to get a little more serious. In my next attempt, I ditched the expensive connectivity and replaced Zephyr with something more basic, free RTOS. I wrote a program consisting of a single task. In this task, I initialized the GPIO clock, configured the GPIO pin as output, and then I toggle the pin and sleep for one second inside a while loop. In the main function, I create the task and start the scheduler. I generated the dependencies with stm 32 cube IDE and wrote a makefile to build it all. Simple enough, the program provides a much more reliable blinking, and I was down to a little over 10,000 bytes. But while an RTOS is useful, it's overkill if all you want to do is blink an LED. So next, I shaved off another layer of abstraction and went with plain C, just the main function, basically doing the same thing as before, but without an RTOS task. Configuring the GPIO pin and then toggling it in a while loop and busy wait for one second each iteration. With this I was down to a couple of thousand bytes, which is significantly smaller, but arguably a bit much given how little I'm doing. This size can partly be explained by the hall from ST I'm using, an abstraction layer on top of the hardware registers. But as I also explained in my previous video, how a microcontroller starts, a C program includes startup code that runs before the main function, and this runtime setup contributes to the program size as well. All of this can be stripped away. But to do that, I had to roll up my sleeves and get down to the bare hardware. I had to write assembly. At its core, the bare minimum register interactions required to blink an LED every second on this microcontroller are as follows. First, register writes to configure the GPIO pin, one to enable the GPIO port clock, and another to set the pin as output. Second, some register writes and reads to toggle the pin state. Finally, for a one second delay, a busy wait loop by writing a large value to a register and then decrement it in a branch loop until zero. This logic essentially translates to the following C code. With the ARM architecture reference manual as my guide, I turn this into somewhat naive ARM assembly code. First configuring the GPIO with a few load and store instructions, then keeping track of the current pin state in register 1, and then a comparison to see whether I should set or reset the pin in each iteration. I load register 2 with a large enough count value, which I decrement in a while loop with a subtraction and branch instruction that results in a 1 second delay. While this approach requires no startup code, I still need a linker script to place the code at the right location in memory. The flash memory of this STM32 starts at hex 8 million, and as I also explained in my previous video, this is where the interrupt vector table lives, and the CPU loads the program counter from the second entry in this table. I don't make use of the stack pointer, but I apparently still have to load it with some value, otherwise the CPU falls. This assembly code gets the job done in 19 instructions and 72 bytes, including the data. But I could do better than that, and after some code golfing, I got it down to 13 instructions and 48 bytes. The main optimizations I did were to reuse register values to cut down on load operations at the cost of setting some unnecessary bits in the peripheral registers, simplify the toggling logic by removing unnecessary branches, and combine address calculations to reduce memory access. By the way, this STM32 microcontroller runs at 4 MHz by default, and the subtraction and branch instructions together takes 3 cycles, so a counter value of 4 million divided by 3 amounts to approximately 1 second. This was the smallest assembly program I could come up with to blink an LED on this STM32, and I could not figure out a way to make it even smaller, but maybe you can. If so, feel free to leave a comment below. Even though I had now hit the limit in program size, there was still more I could do to continue this rather useless journey through abstractions. This time I threw out the assembler and went straight to machine code. 
ones and zeros, that's what it all comes down to in the end. With the ARM architecture reference manual in hand, once again, I tracked down the opcodes for my assembly instructions and painstakingly wrote them out in raw ones and zeros, a tedious process which reminded me of why we don't write our programs directly in machine code anymore. Apart from the raw instructions, I have to place the values I reference, such as addresses and constants somewhere. I place them in a so-called literal pool after the instructions, so I can access them with a PC relative load instruction. Instructions are thumb, so 16 bit wide, while the addresses are 32 bit wide. Following little endian order, the least significant byte comes first. Once again, I have to make sure I place the initial PC and SP register values at the beginning of the interrupt vector table. This is the final machine code, and I can write this to a binary file by piping my text file through a couple of Linux commands. First, filtering out the comments then breaking it up into byte-wide binary numbers and translating those into a hex string then finally writing this string to a binary file blinky.bin diffing it confirms it's identical to the file I produced with the assembler before it's 48 bytes as well so I did not reduce the program size with my machine code which is expected because assembly is mostly a human readable one-to-one -one representation of machine code. But that was not the point. The point was to remove another layer of abstraction, which I did. At last, to get further, I was left with no option but to swap out the microcontroller or remove it altogether. So that's what I did. I know it's kind of cheating when the rules were to write a program that runs on a microcontroller. But honestly, using a microcontroller to blink an LED is overkill. As common as they are these days, not every solution has to involve a microcontroller. Instead, I built a circuit of discrete components, a simple relaxation oscillator circuit where I've sized the capacitors and resistors to get a consistent one second on off time. In fact, this approach is similar to how the turn signal on some motor vehicles is generated. And technically, there you have it, blinky with zero bytes.